To this, the fourth in a series of noon lectures sponsored by the Associated Student Speakers Program, we would like to welcome a longstanding friend of UCLA, Mr. Ray Bradbury. Mr. Bradbury, who began writing at 12 and sold his first article at 19, has over 300 short stories, plays, and novels to his credit. And these include such famous ones as Fahrenheit 451, which was recently made into a movie with Julie Christie, uh, The Wonderful Ice Cream Suit, and Golden Apples in the Sun. A uh, truly wide diversity of magazines, including The New Yorker, New Republic, The Nation, and Playboy have all published his works. Following Mr. Bradbury's presentation, there will be a question and answer period. Unfortunately, the men's lounge where we normally hold our question and answer period is being used by the administration, and we will have our question and answer period here. There are two microphones at the front of the grand ballroom, to the right and to the left of me, and uh, following the break, we will have a question and answer period. Now speaking on the space age, why bother, or how I learned to stop worrying and love LBJ, Mr. Ray Bradbury. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, fellow readers of Playboy and Mad Magazine. It's become a constant greeting of mine because I've been a great admirer of Hugh Hefner's for some years, and a great follower of Mad Magazine for a good many years, because we live in this intellectually stifling climate. Today, I often pose the question and give an answer I believe in, what is the best, the most responsible intellectual magazine in the country today? And the answer really is Mad Magazine. It does the job of cutting everyone off at the knees, doesn't it? it it attacks the uh, TV people, the bad commercials, the lousy magazines, the dreadful bankers, the Republicans, the Democrats, the Communists, the Birchers, you name it. Mad is after them, and I'm after Mad. I think I should start off by explaining the, my title. We sort of made it up as we came in today, and uh, it, it seemed appropriate that LBJ's name be in there somewhere. and. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, or care, if you did know, <laughs> that four or five years ago, I worked on the United States Pavilion at the New York World Fair. I was given the job of filling the whole top of that building, which was as big as this room 20 times over, three or four football fields in size. The United States government came to me and said, uh, how would you like to write a 17-minute history of the United States? I said, fine. <laughs> and uh, I said, with music or without music? <laughs> and they said, hum it for us and we'll decide. <laughs> so I sat down and I wrote a 17-minute prose poem, which is the only way you can possibly attack a thing as huge as our own history of this fantastic country. And squash 400 years into it and make some sense, find the proper metaphors. And when I finished, I had borrowed things that I had learned in writing the screenplay of Moby Dick when I worked on that 13 years ago. I remembered things I had found going back through Jules Verne, one of my heroes from my childhood, and one of my new heroes in recent years since I'd begun to reread him. And I looked at the history of the country and decided we were the wilderness people, which we already know, but we're a combination of wildernesses. We are a triple wilderness people. We are the people who crossed a wilderness of sea to get here. We are the people who crossed a wilderness of grass and nailed it down to stay here. And we are the people who are moving toward a wilderness of stars right now in order to live forever. So it's a very important thing to look at ourselves as a wilderness people and see that it is, it is all of a piece. I wrote this, we brought in an orchestra, we did the 17-minute history of the United States, and we put it in the top of the building 
so that you could go through in the darkness and have the total experience of our people happen to you as you moved in the dark through these various times of the various wildernesses, ending up a billion miles out in space, a billion times a billion miles out in space, a billion years from this day. I was very pleased with the work that we did on the United States Pavilion. I felt it was very important that people from all over the world would come in and say, oh, is that what they are? That every American who came into the building went out and said, oh, is that what I am? I think it's very important for us to find a metaphor for our time, some kind of a rebirth of idealism on some level that we can touch and talk about and fight about and get excited about in order to go on living. Anyway, at the beginning of the second year, the Department of Commerce called me out here and said, look, now when we open the United States Pavilion this spring, we want to do something nice for President Johnson. Now we want you, <laughs> we want you to take out some of that space age stuff you got in that <laughs> exhibit of yours. We want you to take out that space age stuff and we want you to put in something about the great society. <laughs> now I wonder if you can imagine what my reply was. I said, look, if I give you a direct message to LBJ, will you deliver it? He said, yes. I said, tell him he's fired. <laughs> well, I won my point. We did not put anything about the great society into the goddamn building. <laughs> we put more about the space age in. <laughs> because this is indeed the space age. This is the metaphor that represents you. This is the exciting concept that we can speak of and look toward. Something to galvanize our attention and fuse us together on some level or another that works. It's many other things at the same time. But right now, you are the privileged generation. And I say really privileged. What with all uh, the nightmares, and with all the bad things that we could possibly think of, and we can think of them, we know them very well. You are indeed privileged to be alive in this miraculous age when mankind finally gets up and leaves the world and moves out into space. This is the most incredible 30-year period in the total history of mankind. And it's one of the reasons why I grew up loving science fiction and writing in this field, because I could feel a lot of these things stirring in my own bones and in the bones of others. So the question most often has been over the years from people, and I'm sure you would say it to me too if you could say it personally, why do you bother writing in this field? What's it all about? Where do you stand? What have you been up to? Well, I'm sure you can imagine what it must have been like 30 years ago for me at L.A. High School. I was the only student out of 4,000 students who saw the space age coming. I talked about it. I wrote short stories about it. And as a result, I was the class kook. <laughs> I was the boy everyone made jokes about, which means that I had to go out of high school then and buy myself a typewriter and begin to write stories and believe in what I was doing and go on when no one else believed and write these stories. And then about 10 years ago, what came along? Sputnik came along and crossed the night skies of our world and all the laughter began to die. And you know, I've had a glorious 10 years. <laughs> I am not a humble person. I go around saying, I told you so to everyone I meet. <laughs> this is pure gin for anyone who cares. <clears throat> I promised everyone I'd make a brilliant speech today, and that's the only way to do it. Why have I told you this? Isn't it interesting 
that a person like myself, graduate of LA High, who flunked English and had to take it over in the 11th grade in order to remember all those damned rules of grammar, which I don't remember now. <laughs> I can write a sentence, but I don't know why I'm writing it. Isn't it peculiar that a person like myself, who never went on to college, who got a job selling newspapers on the corner of Olympic and Norton for three years in order to write, wound up working on the United States Pavilion 30 years later, trying to figure out what we as a people are, and doing a lot of other things that I've done. And I guess the reason I tell all this to you is because many of you are sitting here today saying, where do you fit? You're the oddballs now, aren't you? Each of you has your secret dream. Each of you has something peculiar in your nature that sometimes you dread to speak of because you're afraid someone's going to make fun of you. You have a private dream. You have a private talent. And I suppose if I'm here today for anything at all, it's to encourage you to become tremendously foolish in the coming years. Because only by being foolish can you be creative. And only by being creative can you have the kind of happy life, I take it, that most of you want. I've had a ball. I've had a wonderful time writing short stories. It's a glorious profession. I wouldn't trade it in for anything else. Oh, I might trade it in for acting. I've loved acting good part of my life, but I had, to, I had to choose when I was 19 whether I was going to go on being a ham bone or whether I was going to write full time and write every single day of my life with high zest and much gusto and much love for this thing. But what about yourselves now? You sit there and you say, yeah, well, where does this all fit in? Well, I take it many of you here today are in the various arts or you wouldn't be sitting here. Many of you probably are actors, some of you paint, some of you write. I can't guess at the other professions. But in every field that you are interested in, the world is waiting for what right now? For someone with originality, wit, intelligence, good humor, and a great gift of love to give to that field. Because the fact is, you live in the time of the sellout, don't you? Isn't everyone selling out? Isn't that the temptation? Are you going to resist it? How many slobs are here today? Thank you. <laughs> There's one brave person. You'll go far. <laughs> now, the temptations exist. Uh, let me name the twin temptations. I often use the lecture title, How to Distinguish Between the Two Varieties of Horse Manure because we live in a time, as in all times, in the history of the world, a time of horse manure, frauds, cheats, fools, stupid people in charge of stupid enterprises. And your temptation in the next few years is going to be money on the one hand and intellectual pretense on the other. Now all the money people are going to come along in your various fields and say, look, sell out to me. Give me your soul, give me your life, wrap it in a package, and I'll give you lots of money. And you'll have a nice big car, and you'll have a good home, and you'll have all these children who will hate you. <laughs> and by the time you're 40, you'll have a psychiatrist who hates you. <laughs> Secretly, of course. <laughs> And you'll have a mistress who'll hate you. And it won't mean a goddamn thing. Believe me, it won't mean a thing. I had the choice 13 years ago. John Houston gave me the job of writing Moby Dick. And when I finished that film, the turning point in my life came because everyone immediately wanted me to write all kinds of films. Someone came along and offered me War and Peace. Well, that's a huge chunk of book to offer to someone to write a screenplay on. The trouble is, I've never been able to read it. <laughs> do you have trouble, as I do, figuring out all those names? Hmm? Okay. At least I'm honest about it, aren't I? Hmm? Most people won't admit. They haven't been able to figure out the names, and they can't get on with the book. I was offered The Friendly Persuasion, which I love. It's a wonderful book. 
and a lot of other films I could have written. But I chose at that time to say, no, I must go away from screenwriting for at least four years and write more books. These are the essence and the center and the soul of my life. I don't exist without my books. I exist through them. So I must bring more of my own children into the world before I write any more screenplays. I love motion pictures. It's very tempting. There are many projects I've worked on free in films over a period of years, simply because I love the medium. But I had to make the big choice of having the huge income, because it means $100,000 a film, and that's awfully handsome. That's not kid ourselves. That's very handsome. But I made the choice. I've gone on writing in the last 13 years the books I felt I had to write. Now, this is an example of the commercial choice you have to make in the coming years. Whether to get along at a certain level of income, whether you're willing to sell newspapers on a street corner or something like it, work in the post office. I worked in Robinson's as a stock boy and ate up all their candy at one time. <laughs> whether you can do this, whether you love what you want to be or whether you don't love it at all. Now, this subject is discussed on countless occasions by countless people. You've been warned about it. The main reason I'm warning you is I don't want you to get to be 40 years old and look around and suddenly be field trapped and say, I have all this money and I've done poorly by myself and something has soured within. I hate myself. I haven't done the one thing I was put on earth to do. That small creative enterprise, no matter how small, I don't care if you want to go out and make the best pair of shoes in the world, for Christ's sake, go do it. But give quality to the world. Good God, there's so little quality. Look, witness what we see all around us. General Motors calling back 35,000 cars. Hmm? One week. 40,000 cars the next week. Ford calling back 70,000 cars. Why? No quality. No quality. I demand this of you. I demand quality from every goddamned one of you here today. You're going to be personally responsible to me, not to anyone else. Let's just, <laughs> let's just put it on this basis. And if we ever meet in the street and you tell me what I'm doing, you'll be able to tell how I feel when I spit in your face. <laughs> we got to draw this kind of line at long last in a very corrupt age. But the main reason for doing it is I want you to have a ball. You want to be happy? You want to have a good time? Find something to love, grab it with your teeth, run with it. That means you deny the advice of your friends, you deny the advice of your relatives, and anyone else who tells you, be a lawyer, be a doctor, be this, be that. No one can tell you that. I wouldn't dream of telling you. How can I guess your secret heart? I can't. No one can, but you can. You hunger for something. God, it's impossible for me to believe you don't. There must be one thing in the world you want to get your teeth into that will make you want to get up in the morning and go to that job and do it and end the day happy with having finished something and offered quality to the world. Because that's the, the great pay is this. When people come to you and look you in the face and say, hey, oh, that was good. That was good. And I've had it happen to me thousands of times. Yes, I like the money that I get from writing my stories. You're damn well right, I do. But the great thing is the face that lights up when a person comes to me and shakes my hand and says, that book, that story, wow, that was good. Now, no one can give that to anyone. You've got to go out and make your own world for that. And there are no guarantees. If you could have read my short stories when I was a teenager, you wouldn't believe I'd ever make it as a writer. They were dreadful. They were lousy. I didn't begin to write well till I was 22. That means a million words down the drain, burned, forgotten, so that I wrote something that was decent. 
So you got to start today, right? As soon as you leave here. To become this thing that I want you to become. A happy human being with a great love. I wish you two loves in your lives. Someone you will marry and be happy with and raise children, a great gift. And the other is the work that you must spend the rest of your life with. You're going to die all too soon. You're going to be old very quickly, believe me. I just didn't dream. Yesterday morning, yesterday morning I was 21. And quite suddenly, I'm getting on toward 50. And it comes quick, kids. It sure does. So you'd better be on the ball about finding your love. Now, the other thing you're going to be attacked with is the intellectual sellout. We know a lot about the money sellout. Let's talk about the intellectual sellout, because that's a way of lying, too. See, this is the year, isn't it, right now, of Albi and Ionesco and Pinter and, uh, well, you name a few others. Why? I should be writing Ionesco plays, shouldn't I? I should be doing Beckett plays. I should be traveling the Albi short circuit. But it's not for me. I can never be them. They can never be me. It would, how foolish to look and say, oh, 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 yeah, that's in big with the liberals. I'm going to write me a McBird. McBird's doing fine. That rubs the liberals all the right ways. I'll write a McBird. But you can't write it if you don't feel it. It's too easy to look around and prostitute yourself for an intellectual concept. That's why there's a lot of bad art in the world a lot of bad writing and a lot of bad politicking by people who don't really believe what they're saying. So somewhere along the line, I learned how to travel between the two ways of lying. Selling out for money, selling out for a political or intellectual concept. That's why so much Russian art is so dreadful. Hmm? All this painting, a lot of painting in America in the middle 30s is simply dreadful. You've got all kinds of workers sludging around the fields, uh, harvesting grain and lifting stones and, uh, and pitting, uh, putting their shoulders against grindstones, etc., etc. Hmm? Because it was a thing to paint. But I'm telling you, you can't do it that way. You can't look at what's being done by other people. You've got to look in here. As this thing wants out. This person, with a hell of a yell, must come on display of the world and say, I, as an individual, see the world this way, totally alone. And you know something? You have the strength of thousands. Politically, if you want to go into politics, a one person speaking alone has more power than most of the groups. I have more power here today speaking as an individual, totally alone with no one around that I have to fall back on. And what I say to you, if you bring up any subject, will be straightforward and honest and will have more power than a group. And you'd better believe that. So when I tell you that LBJ is Uriah Heep, hmm? I think I can get you to think about that with his unctuousness and his, his falseness and his double dealing all up and down the line. Now, it's kind of nice to have just one person saying this instead of a group. Now, what applies in politics applies in creativity, applies in writing, and in painting. You make your own style. You make your way of life, and others follow. There's no way of guaranteeing when you go out into the marketplace that everyone is going to want to read your books or buy your paintings or see your acting. You just do your best, that's all. And put your wares on display. And finally, a small crowd collects, and that's your audience. I have a very small audience, really, in the entire mass of the United States. I'm not a bestseller, never have been. Don't particularly wish to be if the number of books over the years begins to go up well and good. What I'm interested in is finding out just who in hell I am. And this process is going to go on to the end of my life. I love to delve into my subconscious, find out what its fears are. So all of my early books are books of nightmares, my personal nightmares. I was afraid of the dark till I was 20. I had to get rid of that. 
went to Mexico when I was 25, saw the mummies of Guanajuato, went down to the catacombs. They scared the hell out of me. I had to come out of the catacombs and get rid of that. Write it on paper. Hand it on to you. Scare hell out of you. <laughs> Let me give you another example of the sort of thing I'm talking about. This is a true story. You may have seen it quoted in the, I think Cecil Smith quoted it a few weeks ago. Paul Newman came to me a couple of years back and I wanted to use him in some of my plays. I gave him all my plays to read and he came back and he said, Ray, he says, if you really want to learn to be a playwright, you've got to go and read a really good playwright. And I said, well, who? He says, Pinter. I said, okay, drive me to your nearest friendly bookstore and I will buy all the books of Pinter and I will read them. I am very open-minded. So I went and bought all the plays of Pinter and I read them and I came home and I wrote to my agent and I said, I refuse to praise Pinter to please Paul. <laughs> and that was the end of that. <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't get Paul Newman from my place. The ability to know which we all know what is good for us, what feels good. Actually, we all know when we're getting sick, don't you? I think we do. And when we ignore the signals over a period of years, we wind up with a sick individual or a sick society. But we all know as the hairball accumulates here. Now, if you sell out for money, or if you sell out for intellectual pretense, what do you ignore to your own danger? You ignore this thing in you that wants to come out. It's like a long hairball. You gotta grab hold of one piece and begin to unwind it. All of your tensions, all of your fears, all of your dreams, over a period of years that you're going to put on paper if you're a writer, or paint on a canvas if you're a painter, or act out as an actor if that is your profession. But if you sell out, you turn away from yourself. You're listening to other people, aren't you? Other people know how to paint. Other people know how to write. And they tell you, a producer, or a director, or an editor, or someone in charge of the bestseller lists, or even on some occasions, let's move over into the intellectual field, a professor in a college who tells you what to write because Salinger is the big thing. Hmm? and you damn well better do the Salinger type thing if you want to get an A in his course. And you know it, and this you have to fight. So going back to the individual thing, finding out what you want. Now some of you, your immediate response to everything I've said here today is, yes, but I don't love anything. I haven't found anything yet. I, I haven't latched on to anything. The answer to that is, begin to move around in this fantastic society that you live in. This is a world inhabited by incredible machines. You can do something to change one of those machines and thus change thousands of lives. What, what is the central problem, problems of our time? They're all mechanical, they're all technological. Both political parties find themselves on very uneasy terms with our machinery. There is no political answer to the rapid transit problem in Los Angeles. There's no political answer to smog. The Republicans don't have the answer, and the Republicans don't have it. The Democrats don't have it. That was a very interesting slip, wasn't it? <laughs> have you noticed you haven't been able to tell the parties apart lately? <laughs> That's very fine, very fine. <laughs> Thank you, subconscious. <laughs> And that's one of the causes for our great uneasiness through our total society today. We want the Democrats to come to us and say, here's how we do it, and the Republicans. But what we need is certain kind of technological experts and creative people from many parts of our society to take a total look, a creative architect, a man like Walt Disney, if he were still alive, to go down and run our city for us. 
because we need someone who knows the, the logistics of human motion. And that's what our huge city is suffering from right now. Now, there's a place for many of you within this problem right here in L.A. to clean up our mess for us because our city's dying. New York is well on its way to the grave. The car will probably be outlawed there sometime within the next 15 years. We're killing 52,000 people a year on our highways. We are wounding with our cars 3 million people a year. Can you imagine that? 3 million. It makes Vietnam seem awfully small suddenly, doesn't it? The difference between the death rate on our highways and the wounding rate is titanic compared to Vietnam. Now, why am I interested in science fiction? Because all of these machines are changing your lives, and in what way? Let me pose you a question. Who set the Negro free in this country? Did the white man set him free? Like hell. I'll tell you, three science fictional devices, or maybe four, that were impossible a few years ago. And if you wrote them in a short story and published it 50 years back, people would have laughed you out of the house. If you'd said, there's going to be a new device called television that's going to educate people and give them ideas, maybe pretty mediocre on a pretty shallow level, but give them ideas, show them the world, show them the country. There's going to be a thing called radio that didn't exist 47 years ago, that recently. And there's going to be a thing called an automobile that couldn't cross the United States as recently as 45 years ago. There were no highways. See, you've been born you th with everything put here before you. It's been made. You think it's been here forever. 45 years ago, you couldn't cross this country. The roads were so dreadful that you had to camp out, and you might make it in about 30 days of camping out. There were no hotels, no motels, very few gas stations, and dirt roads. So it was like not much better than 1880 or 1860. Suddenly, these devices come along and begin to teach people about travel and tell them they can become a fluid society on the move. So the Negro looks at TV, listens to radio, gets in his car, puts one gallon of gas in it, and is on his way. And suddenly we have 500,000 Negroes here, 500,000 Negroes there, where we never planned for them, did we? And all of a sudden, we've got to start planning. We've got to start thinking. Because people are on the move everywhere, not just Negroes, but the white race, in constant motion, all over this fantastic country of ours. Now, these are science fictional ideas. This is the stuff I've been writing about since I was a child. That's why I'm fascinated with the entire field of the reaction of the human being to the machine and back again. We have peace today. We are making do with our situation in Vietnam and everywhere else in the world because of one science fictional device, the hydrogen bomb. It has turned out to be the greatest single mover toward peace in the entire history of the world. And every night when I go to bed, I pray for the hydrogen bomb. <laughs> I love it. I really do. Because it's preventing us from venting our rage and savagery on ourselves in one more stupid war that would kill a million people a week instead of 200. There is the difference. And it all lies in this fabulous machine we've invented for ourselves, which prevents us from acting on our rage as in the past. So I think this begins to give you an idea of why I'm working in the field that I'm working in. How about yourselves? Where is your place in the space age? I went down to Houston a year ago. Some of you may have seen my article in Life five weeks back. I was sent there by Life magazine to look at all the equipments at Houston. Next year sometime I'm going down to Cape Kennedy whenever the first rocket takes off to actually land on the moon. Tremendously exciting thing for me since I'm the son of Buck Rogers out of Flash Gordon. But I got down there and I looked around, and I had to find things to love, too. There was so much to see, suddenly. I had to make, very quickly, the kind of decision you must make 
during the next year or so about your own lives? How do you make do with this society? How do you narrow it down? How do you find the personal metaphor for each one of you? How do you fit into this? And I saw so much at Houston that I came back to LA and I called life on the telephone. I said, please, fire me off the project. They said, you're crazy. Why? I said, because there's too much. Uh, I've never seen so many things in so few days. It's too confusing. I don't know how to write an article about it. They said, we believe in you. Stick with it. I said, how long do I have? They said, 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got up the next day, and I found the metaphor, which went into the article. And I wrote the article in six hours and sent it off to New York. And it worked. And the metaphor was, of course, that down in Houston, we have a fabulous theater of history. Nobody has pointed this out that I know of before that we are acting out history before we commit ourselves to history. And I used the metaphor within the article of having Christopher Columbus in 1490 go to the Queen of Spain and say, give me some money. I want to build not three ships, but 21 ships. And I want to dig myself a false sea of Spain in the center of Spain and fill it with water during the worst season of the year and take 21 crews of men and set them sailing on this false sea of Spain. And then I'm going to go to Leonardo da Vinci. And I'm going to say to him, Leonardo, you love robots. You love machines. Tell you what I want you to do. I want you to build me some steam-driven, fantastic, monstrous robot shapes that I can sink in this false sea of Spain. Because out beyond the edge of the earth, we all know where we're supposed to drop off. All these monsters are waiting for us. All these Baroque terrors, these dreadful beings and nightmares. So I want you to build these for me and make them into mechanical things that will rise up out of the deep deeps and terrify my men. And Leonardo says, great. <laughs> and he, he then goes and he builds the robot monsters. Columbus sinks them in the false sea of Spain. He sets sail. Many of the ships sink. Storms come on. Some of the ships break apart. Many of the men are lost. And at the end of two years of experimentation, Columbus goes down to the real sea of Spain and sets sail for elephant India and makes history by bumping into the islands off the coast of America. Now, by using this metaphor, I was able to give you some idea of what's going on down in Houston. That they are indeed building the machineries now. They are working with directors. They are actors. They're working on stages. And the better they rehearse themselves, the better prepared they will be when it comes time to go out into space, where a mistake that is only one billionth of a second long will destroy them right then and there. So I use this as an, as an example. The things I saw in Houston, the way I related to them, as something for you to think about. In other words, you must find your own metaphor. You must find the chord you wish to strike in this whole society. But remember this, if you're in religion, if you're studying religion now, every aspect of God and the church are changing aren't they, and have been changing in the last 10 years. And it all began, really, when we went into space. The year before the first Sputnik went up, Pope Pius XII said, God does not wish to set any limits to our inquiries into our motion in space. This put him a year ahead of most of the intellectuals in the world. Most of the other people were ignoring space activities, and suddenly, in 1957, Sputnik took off and went around the world. Since then, God supposedly has died. But it reminds me of that old song, shut the door, he's coming in the window, shut the window, he's coming through the floor. Hmm? Remember that? Ever heard it? Well, that's what's happening. God dies to be reborn in new shapes. This is your job. Find the new shapes. Find the new shapes for us in sociology, in psychology, 
Everything is being turned over by our machines. Tell us what you can find in those fields. In the field of, uh, of, 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 of data processing uh, alone, most of these machines didn't exist 10 years ago. There's something for many of you in that field. And as for you so-called creative people in the arts, take a long look at the total society and say, this is how I paint it, this is how I write it, this is how I act it out. It's a very exciting time. And you cannot use the hydrogen bomb as an umbrella to hide under and say, I'm not going to do anything because we, we all might be blown up day after tomorrow. I won't allow that because we might be dead tomorrow in a million ways anyway. And anyway, I don't believe it's going to happen. I'm an optimist. I'm sorry to spoil your day, <laughs> but I'm an optimist about this. Now, I take it it's getting on toward the time when a lot of you have got to run to class. So this might be a good point for me to break it let those who have to leave, leave. Those of you who wish to stay on for the question period, by all means, do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bradbury. We will reconvene for questions and answers in about five minutes. If you have, I'm sure you have more to say, Mr. Bradbury. You can just continue until you want to stop. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Come on. Uh, one here, Mr. Bradbury. Oh, yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Why don't you go to the microphone and ask a question? Oh, Mr. Bradbury, I was wondering, do you watch television? Do I like tele? Do I, I do write you, for television? Do you watch it? Do I watch it? Yeah. Uh, do you watch Star Trek by any chance? Yeah. Uh, what is your opinion on uh, the uh, fact that uh, they're intending to cancel it in March? Well, I'm, I'm fairly unhappy because uh, I haven't seen every one of them, of course, but the few that I have seen, uh, I thought were awfully good. And it's a shame to take off a show like that and leave, well, Lucy on. Huh? <laughs> Or that dreadful, what is it? Uh, I don't even know the the in-laws. Is that what it's called? Uh, or Good sure. Morning World? Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> so uh, anything we can all do to keep it on, it would be very nice. Well, I hear that NBC is will consider extending it if they receive about a hundred thousand cards. Okay, guys, you hear that? <laughs> so we'll all start writing. Uh, yes. Oh, I see. Over here. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bradbury, I under, I've read recently somewhere that uh, another one of your stories is going to be made into a movie. Is, is that correct? Actually, um, three this year. It's, it's going to be a wonderful year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, this all happened, uh, I had nothing to do with uh, especially the one deal. The Illustrated Man, for instance, will start shooting in four weeks starring Rod Steiger and Claire Bloom. Now you can't do any better than that. I mean, it's just... They are our finest. He is our finest American actor. Sure. I had nothing to do, yeah. I, uh, I consider myself absolutely fortunate because I didn't cast him. I had nothing to do with his selection. The uh, director cast the film and bought the property from me a year ago. I didn't do the screenplay. So all of a sudden I find I'm working, though, with Rod Steiger, which is beautiful. The uh, second project is called the Picasso Summer, uh, starring Albert Finney, and hopefully sometime in the next six weeks, Picasso himself, and uh, in which uh, we're going to have Picasso draw on the sand of the Mediterranean shore and animate his drawings. How do you like that, okay? I think it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. And then the third thing I'm doing uh, is a history of Halloween in cartoon form, and it's going to be animated by Chuck Jones, who won an Academy Award for the dot in the line, and he has done these beautiful Roadrunner cartoons and Bugs Bunny for years. <laughs> and uh, my favorite TV show is Bugs Bunny. 
Sure, I'm, I'm not kidding, it is. Uh, they, I, when I come home every afternoon, I tell the kids, when Bugs comes on, call me. <laughs> and so I run in immediately. Uh, so I'm doing a history of Halloween, in other words, a history of my people. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, one more part, Mr. Bradbury. Yeah. Um, are you going to have any more plays produced in the near future? Yes, uh, I hope a month from now, a new play of mine will open at the Coronet or the Ivar or the Warner's Playhouse, depending on which theater collapses first. Uh, it's, like waiting, it's like waiting for someone to die. Uh, you wait for other plays to collapse, and then whatever theater opens up, you go into. I've done a three-act Irish comedy on my experiences in Ireland when I lived there with John Houston 13 years ago. We have a beautiful cast, and uh, if we get all the money together this week, we'll start rehearsals immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Yes. As regards your feelings about the space explorations uh, that we're going into this decade and in the future, uh, are you really so certain that it's a good thing that we're moving so fast? When we look out around the world, the whole species is busy discriminating against itself on varying bases, including sex, race, color of skin, religion. And uh, actually, <coughs> when you say that fighting a war that kills 200 people a week isn't so bad, it's still bad enough. And sure there's, is. No, there's no possibility that if we move into outer space now, even in this century, that we're not going to continue this activity, regardless of how much outer space is going to eventually change our behavior. Are you sure it's that good a project to move out now when we can't even control ourselves on this planet? <coughs> I think we have to put ourselves back in Columbus's shoes again, don't we? And if he had said what you said right now, we all wouldn't be here today, would we? That's not really true. The explorations came before Columbus and after him. And well, the, point then, uh, the point is that when the Europeans did explore, what they brought to the New World was worse than what they had back home. They created more problems here. 90% of the American problems dealing with social behavior are not American in origin. And the European explorers were mostly the ones who brought them here, and the settlers. OK, and everyone out. <laughs> we're all going back to Europe. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't explore space, but is it necessarily the most positively good thing we can do to move out now? Shouldn't we uh, try to solve our problems first? No, no. But I how can we solve them across <laughs> planets? No, we shouldn't try to solve them first because we never have and we never will. I accept man. See, the difficult thing for you, and I think most of you, and myself to accept, is the paradoxical nature of man. Now, it's time you all took a big swallow of a very bitter medicine and began to grow up. The time of Columbus, the time of Caesar, and our time are no different. And a thousand years from today, it's not going to be any different. And 100,000 years from today, we're still going to be goddamn fools. But we're going to be brilliant at the same moment. We're going to be beautiful. We're going to be great. We're going to destroy. And we're going to murder. And we're going to be beautiful. We're going to be great. And we're going to go through cycles. And we're all going to despair. And then we're all going to be elated again. And this, I'm afraid, and I accept it, but I intend to work to better it, as the history of mankind. This is why Bernard Shaw has not been a popular playwright in this country. Most people don't like to swallow his pills. And what he's always saying to us is, what's the truth? And then for one whole act, he'll give you what he thinks you think the truth is. And he gets you out on a limb, and then <laughs> he saws the limb off, doesn't he? And you fall down, and you clutch frightened to the next limb, and you say, gee, Mr. Shaw, is this the truth? And he says, you think it is? And you say, yeah, and then he saws that limb off. <laughs> that is what life is. The murderer is in me, the fool is in me, the destroyer is in me, as it is in every one of you, but we have choices to build. I believe the space age 
is a way of making a fabulous choice to fuse the race into one, to name us one people instead of diversive peoples. This is the way I choose to look at it. I will proselytize for this vision. Now that's all idealism is. It's a momentary means of using a certain kind of metaphor to tell us what we might possibly be for a little while. And we discard the tool and go on to the next. So the space age is a means of lifting ourselves up and making ourselves better if we wish. Now if we want to be just idiots with it, we can build space warheads and disintegrators and go off to the moon and blow the whole goddamn thing up and just be as stupid as we've been in the past. I will work against this. I will work for the peacetime use of space. But I see ways of this making us a single race. And that's why I believe in the space age. Now, it's up to you to work with me to name the, name the race properly, name the time properly, and work to see that we get the thing working. Now, there are no guarantees, but we've got to try. And it can be a substitute for war. This is the most important thing. For tens of thousands of years, we have searched for something as big, as titanic, as terrifying, as malignant, in a way, as war. Something to make us excited. Peace isn't exciting, is it? It's boring. So what do we do? We turn around and rend each other's flesh. Suddenly, falling into our hands is a means whereby we can excite ourselves as we do in war, but for peacetime acti activity. To find out about the universe. To name a proper enemy. And the enemy is the universe itself. It doesn't care what we do to ourselves. We must care. That blind abyss out there doesn't care if the sun blows up tomorrow and we're all wiped out like that, or if we have one war here and another war there. We then must name our enemy, which is the total universe. We are that part of the universe which comes alive, names itself to survive and goes out to live forever. Because if we make it, we will. Then the wars can't kill us off. Do you see how important it is? I don't want us to stay here and take the chance of destroying our own flesh. And we can. I'm no Pollyanna. I'm not going to give you any happy endings. I'm not going to hand you any crud about this. You're dangerous, every one of you. And I am too. And we're trying to become human. Our goal is to become this fantastic creature we call the human being. But we haven't made it yet. Space is going to give us another chance, another breather, another world to survive. And anyway, we want the gift of life to pass on. I don't care how depressed you are. I don't care how destructive you are. I don't care what you criticize in our society. Isn't there a part of every day when the gift is fabulous? It's got to be for every one of you. It is for me, and I've seen a lot of things. But some days, simple breathing, simple breathing is so gorgeous. And you're going to have to carry me off this earth screaming, kids, because I won't want to go. Boy, what a long answer to a short question. <laughs> Let's see. Over here now? You're going to be afraid to ask now. Where do you feel ocean exploration fits in with space exploration. Fits in beautifully. In fact, we're using uh, ocean exploration to train ourselves for space. Uh, one of the hugest um, factories down at Houston is an underwater um, factory where they train the astronauts to be weightless. And of course, when you get into water, you have a weightless situation. And beyond that, of course, the whole situation of feeding ourselves in the coming years, uh, f finding out about all these life forms. We know nothing about the ocean, really. So it's a twin thing. I'm all in favor of moving in both directions. Do you feel that ocean exploration would be more as a tool used to help the space instead of uh, something as um, individual in itself? In other words, when you go into space, you're, ex you're leaving the Earth, but when you go into the ocean, you're still on the Earth and part of it. Well, I think this, the uh, ocean exploration can be used, too, as a means of fusing the nations instead of separating them. I'd like to see more of this oceanography being carried out by countries working together. 
and the sooner we move toward Russia and other nations to form teams to do this work, the happier I'll, I'll be. Okay? Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, first, I want to say that I have read some of your stuff, and as a matter of fact, just as late as last night, I read your article in last month's Playboy, uh, which Good. I thought was pretty amazing. Uh, you said earlier in your uh, lecture that uh, you went different places and you had the hell scared out of you and you wrote them down to uh, transfer them to us. I want to know where it was you went that caused you to write the Martian Chronicles. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'm not going to tell. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, actually, that's a very good question because I wrote the Martian Chronicles in my middle 20s. And when I was courting my wife, and we'd go play miniature golf, and <laughs> a lot of good cheap stuff. My wife had to work for three years after we got married in order to support this writer so that he could get going. And that's the kind of life I'm describing for you that you've got to make up your minds about in order to get what you love. But she didn't mind, and I didn't mind, we got the work done. And by the time I was 30, suddenly we turned a corner and I was able to support a family. But it's like being a doctor or anything else. It takes a good number of years. The Martian Chronicles was written without knowing it as a series of short stories that I tried out of my subconscious one after another. I word associated the typewriter constantly. Uh, a good 30% of my stories are word association stories. In other words, I type things like the dwarf, the knight, the wind, uh, the desert, the frog on paper. And I say to myself, what does that noun mean? Why have I put it on paper? <clears throat> well, let's bring some people in to talk about it. So I bring in two people, and they begin to talk. And two hours later, I have a short story. So the subconscious is waiting to be dredged. There's so much in each one of you. You see, I, I have such a personal desire for each of you to bring this thing out of yourself. Because if it stays in there, it's going to drive you crazy. You're going to be insane. You're going to need help in your 40s. You're going to have all kinds of problems. But if you keep throwing up, from now on, bringing it all out in the open, saying, ah, 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 I'm afraid of that. I love this. How, do, how, how did I write dandelion wine? I, I began a series of associative experiments. I'd write a page about tennis shoes for no reason. Just let's write everything I know about tennis shoes in the summertime. Let's write everything I know about grass. Let's write everything I know about the smell of the wind. Ah, ah, let's... Let's write a short story about the day I discovered I was alive for the first time. It happens to all of us when we're nine or ten. Suddenly we look around, the wind is a certain way, the temperature is a certain way, and we look at the hair on the back of our arms, and, and we smell the air, and we say, my God, I'm alive. Why didn't I know this before? Why haven't I ever declared it? And on that day, we declare. And it's, it's a panic. It's a, it's a dreadful elation and fear almost because you, you're trapped in this body and you say, oh, I, I didn't ask for this but God, it's great, it's wonderful and you go around feeling everything and a couple of years later when you're 12, 13 or 14, it depends you discover you can die you can die someday and the great black bulldog seizes you with his teeth and won't let go and you're terrified at the thought of death and you say, I know what I'll do. I'll kill myself. <laughs> and you know, the, you're playing into his hands. You can't do that. You can't escape death by killing yourself. There's your paradox again. So you decide to go on living. You decide to go on living. So in dandelion wine are these two poles, which I wrote about back and forth, back and forth, experimenting, writing about the grass, writing about the gift of life, writing about the dark, the lonely one, the ravine coming in. And out of all this, one day, suddenly, a book appeared. I didn't know I was writing a novel. Again, both books were short stories which suddenly cohesed and clung to each other like children in need and looked to me, their father, and said, hey, <laughs> here we are. You didn't know it. 
That's the best kind of writing there is. You didn't know it. Surprise. That's what I want for all of you. Surprise every day of your life. Some element in every day where you bring something out in the open and surprise yourself. That's the great thing about the arts. I know enough about drawing. I draw a little every day. I'm a doodler. I've done some sunny painting. But I know the beautiful thing is when you finally train this hand well enough, it has a brain all to itself, and it begins to do things, and you watch. And you sort of watch out of the corner of your eye, and suddenly the thing is there. You say, hey, how did I do that? And you don't know. Cocteau once said, I've already painted the picture. Now I have to uncover it. He goes to the canvas and he begins to paint. It's already there. I've got to uncover it. Isn't that nice? Yeah. It's already here. I must uncover it. So that's what I want for you, each one of you. <laughs> Believe me, I do. Uh, let's see. Which side? Over here. Yes. No, that side. Really? Okay. Uh, <laughs> got him scared. No, you just mentioned Dandelion Wine, and another book I read was uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes. And I just, I just can't see how someone can apply the term science fiction to certain of your works, a great many of your works, even ones with rocket ships and everything in them. It seems like uh, um, just a generalization where it doesn't belong. It's a common error. I've had to suffer it for years. Uh, even The Martian Chronicles is not science fiction. It's fantasy. It's a cautionary fantasy. And uh, uh, oh, there are only a few stories in it that you could call science fiction. And of course, dandelion wine is not. A, dandelion wine is uh, magic realism, I guess, if you wanted to use painting terms. And something wicked this way comes is, uh, is a horror fantasy. It's a, with philosophical overtones Do you have a label? and stuff like that there. Can you label yourself? <laughs> A big pardon? Can you label yourself as a... No, as I would student? label, and if you've heard me say this before, forgive me, but when I die, God forbid, many years from now, I have a lot to do, I would like these words on my tombstone. Here lies a teller of tales. That's an honorable profession. If you went to Cairo today, or Baghdad, or anywhere in the Middle East, and went down a certain street and turned into a little alley, you would find the tellers of tales there, right today, sitting among the children and speaking the old myths. And that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. And that is the way I see myself. I'm a teller of tales, I'm a speaker of myths, and uh, that's enough. Thank you. Yes, I was wondering if they are going to go ahead and film the Martian Chronicles now, or if they have still decided not to film it. Well, I've warned them, if they don't hurry up and do it, we'll have to do it on location. <laughs> <laughs> and a few more years after that, it'll be a costume picture. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think when the uh, Illustrated Man comes out later this year, if it's good, and I think it will be, and if the um, <clears throat> other films turn out well, this will make people brave enough to try The Martian Chronicles. Another thing is happening a month from today. A month from today in Paris, on the stage, The Martian Chronicles will open as a stage play with music, with ballet, with motion pictures, total theater. It's being directed by Jean-Louis Barrault, and if it's any good, that may change things, too. We'll just have to wait and see. Thank you. Sir. In uh, Something Wicked, This Way Comes, and several other of your stories, you have the uh, October people or the uh, autumn people, these faceless and nameless <coughs> people that uh, seem to scourge the land in search of... Uh, people who are frustrated and uh, unhappy. Wh who or what in our society do you think this is, this metaphor that you use? The autumn people, you mean? Yes. I think LBJ is an autumn person. You see, this, here's the whole thing about war that is never discussed. It's out of bounds. And it should be talked about more because I think it's the real reason. I don't think wars have very much to do, not as much to do with, with moving goods as we say and boundaries as we say and all the other kinds of power plays as we say. 
I think it's just as simple as the old men of the world being jealous of the young men and their sexual activities. It's just that simple. You know, they hate your guts, kids. Yeah. I'm not on that side of the hill yet, so I don't hate you. <laughs> I'm, I'm still having a lot of fun, okay? Don't tell my wife, though, huh? <laughs> this is it. They feed off the wonderful deliciousness of the death of the young. I, I, I just can imagine in their, when they go to bed at night, all these old men lying there thinking about all the young men dying. It's a great thought. Wonderful. What else would you want to dream about, huh? These guys are getting everything you no longer have, and you hate them. And I believe that's it, and that's what makes the autumn people, the people who feed off the agonies of others, and they want to agonize you. And my word to you is, don't let them do it. Okay? Well, uh, do you want to get on the merry-go-round that goes backwards and uh, become young again, or do you? Are you? I think I'll stick right where I am. I, uh, we're all tempted, aren't we, <laughs> to get on that merry-go-round and go, go back, but it wouldn't work, because <laughs> we'd lose all of our friends. We'd leave all our friends behind. And uh, they wouldn't like us anymore, and we wouldn't like them. So if everyone could get in the merry-go-round at the same time and go back and become younger, that might be different. But this, uh, and of course the other thing too, uh, the new uh, science of freezing people, supposedly waking them up in 200 years, this is sheer insanity. How would it feel to wake up and go to the nearest graveyard and see all your children buried there, hmm? Eee, no, it, it won't work, it simply won't work. It won't work to outlive everyone and wake up and find out everyone's gone. All the meaning of life is gone. And you'd simply go insane, that's all. Uh, if it ever happens, I, I would be willing to predict the insanity of the person involved within a very short period of time. Okay? All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ray, I dug a, a great deal of the, uh, your imagery and what you've written. And it sort of sounds... Uh, something similar to what the Beatles are doing in their songs. <laughs> That's good. It's got a, uh, uh, carries a lot of meanings and stuff in it. But uh, w I was trying to, to get to what you were trying to get across here and uh, about this wonderful vision of the future. I don't know whether you, you see yourself as a prophet or not, but if we're supposed to, to arrive at this wonderful gingerbread land where everybody's brothers uh, just what type of evolutionary tool are we going to use since uh, there doesn't seem to be anything that uh, you Well, mentioned? certainly we have many evolutionary tools at hand where, whereby we can experiment. We have all of the empathy machines. We have motion pictures. We have radio. We have TV. We have records. And we have all kinds of other extensions of these, which I'm very curious about. I wrote a short story in Playboy a year ago, maybe some of you saw it, called The Lost City of Mars, in which I take a person rather like Dylan Thomas, who was a self-destroyer, a grievance collector par, par excellence, with his barracuda wife. And I sent him into an environment where you can destroy yourself over and over again with these empathy machines. I'm curious about violence. I'm curious about hatred. I'm curious about the need to kill. I'm curious about love, all these things. We all are. We're very young yet. We're, it's very primitive, the things we're beginning to experiment with. If you can send a person into such an environment, I posed this problem for a whole room full of psychiatrists one night. I had all the major psychiatrists from Cedar sinai in one room, about 100 of them. And I posed the question, I said, this short story of mine, if we send a grievance collector who wants to be killed into an environment that will kill him over and over again, blow him up, shoot him down, run over him with a railroad, explode him in a rocket, a hundred times over, when he comes out of that environment, what happens to him? Is he cured? Does he get over his need to be destroyed? Or have you just tickled his fancy for more? Does he go insane? because you've driven him over the brink? Or, thirdly, fourthly, does nothing happen? Does it not affect him in any way? 
You know what the psychiatrist said to me? Nothing. Got no response. Isn't that interesting? I want to know. I want to know. And I think we are going, you ask me what tools we have? We have many tools. We're experimenting with them now. Motion pictures is one of the big ones for finding ways of releasing violence out to the sides so the main energy can take us up between. Now, there's so much we still don't know. And this is where I want our money and our time and our thought and energy to go, a heck of a lot of it, <coughs> to find out why we have the need for war constantly, find out what valid substitutes we can have. That's why I like space travel. I've already said this. It's, it's huge. It can kill. It is very dangerous. But it can be peaceful. So all these machines we're building now, if we use them correctly, can be the tools whereby to implement the discoveries we make about the violent self. Well, who's but who's but I'm not fully qualified. What? Who is to say how to use these, uh, these tools? Presently, I mean, there's all kinds of people who say what to do and how to do it and tell you this and that. Well, this is a, I take it we're living in a democracy. I take it we don't, but. <laughs> I take it we'd better. I take it we'd damn well better then, right? So if you I, think we I don't have so. a democracy, the next thing we have to do before we do anything else is make our democracy work. Now, that's a job for the coming year, the coming 10 years, the coming 100 years. Our cities are too big. We've got to break them down into smaller units. I think some sort of vote occurring twice a year on major issues should be instituted. I think town hall meetings should come back. There should be more meetings between the citizens and the governors constantly, at least once a month. There should be some sort of town meeting at which Mayor Yorty would be called, oh, Mayor Yorty? <laughs> would be called on the carpet by all of us, and we would That'd be great. How do we how do we get a Reagan and a Yorty and a Johnson, you know, like How did we get Reagan? We got Reagan because we that? got Johnson. Most people haven't recognized this. The reason Reagan is governor of this state right now is because of President Johnson and his crappy foreign policies. <laughs> the Democrats elected Reagan. Orange County had nothing to do with it. Not a thing. Sorry, kids. I saw an article in the Yale, uh, Yale uh, newspaper last week. Orange County, the county that elected Reagan. What a lot of crap that was. Not so. The Democrats elected Reagan, and they did it because they hate President Johnson's guts, and they wanted to get him where he lived, right? OK. One more question now. It's getting pretty late. Yes. Well, it's always been uh, a fairly common practice for budding artists and artisans to apprentice themselves to the masters in their trade and, and spend you know, the arduous apprenticeship learning to master individual elements of style, this kind of brush stroke, stroke that kind of lighting, et cetera. And I wondered how much that kind of formal approach to development of style through study characterized your own development as a writer. It wasn't formal. It was wild and maniacal. <clears throat> Let me give you, as quickly as pos possible, a very swift rundown of my influences, which are in many ways totally mediocre and absolutely dreadful. I am a child of Buck Rogers. I started collecting him when I was nine years old. I have all the Buck Rogers strips put away. I've collected Prince Valiant for 30 years. I have all those put away. Collected Flash Gordon from the time I was 14 till I was 18. I have these put away. Love Jules Verne, H.G. Wells. Biggest influence as I was growing up was Edgar Rice Burroughs. My Mars could not exist if Edgar Rice Burroughs' Mars had not been there before. So that's all pretty dreadful, isn't it? Huh? Isn't it revealing? Very interesting. <laughs> Robert Louis Stevenson, Mark Twain, Oscar Wilde, Portrait of Dorian Gray, things like that, Jekyll and Hyde, boy, that's great. All these lovely, wonderful, romantic horror things that I grew up on. And you go and read my article in the latest Playboy and you'll find out more about my other miserable tastes too. I went to every horror film over and over again. I've seen Phantom of the Opera, the original with Lone Chaney, at least 15 times. I've seen Frankenstein 20 times. I've seen Dracula 25 times. 
I'm a child of the cinema. I started seeing films like Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1923. Right on up through, I've seen just about every film ever made. So I'm well qualified in that field. I've collected all, I've loved comic strips all my life, all the popular art forms. Been interested in advertising. Uh, my favorite magazine to read is Graphis, the international Swiss magazine, which shows you everything that's going on in the field of packaging or designing playing cards or putting covers on books or doing posters for movies, you name it. It's fascinating. It's ironic that the finest art in the world today, and I mean it, is not being done in the galleries, it's being done in advertising all over the world. So if you grab onto a magazine like Graphis and look at it, you'll see all the really great work that's being done in a commercial field where people rise to the top and say, I'm not going to be just commercial, I'm going to be creative. And it happens there. It does happen. My other influences, Aldous Huxley, Thomas Wolfe, William Faulkner, Eudora Welty, Catherine Ann Porter, Willa Cather, John Collier. John Collier, very fine writer. And continually over the years, I go back to Sax Romer, Fu Manchu, I love... Fleming. I've read all the Bond books, tried to get the movies to make them into films years ago. They wouldn't listen to me. And I've said, I told you so to them ever since. <laughs> the movies have only made what? You know, a zillion dollars, if you want to speak commercially. But I loved them on another level. They were great fun. So if I have anything to offer you, it's this. Have Catholic tastes, widespread shallow at times, deep in other places, but don't be afraid of exhibiting bad taste. I'd much rather have you vulgar and fun than well-learned and the goddamn bores that so many of these people are. Hmm? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Bradbury. Thank you very much for being our guest.